Shalom, shalom. Welcome to Ma'oz Israel. On today's program, we begin a series, Israel at War. We'll discuss the events of October 7th and more. Stay tuned. Israeli Prime Minister declared war following Islamists infiltrating Israeli territory in a multi-front surprise terrorist attack against civilians. Hamas burned our villages to the ground. One of those villages had an ambulance that stood ready to take kids from Gaza to Hadassah Hospital. They didn't care. They attacked everyone they saw. Anyone, Jew, Arab, Bedouin, Druze, Christian, Muslim. We're at war only the fourth in my lifetime. There is so much need. We have to focus so we can help in a way that matters. We focus on three areas. The basic needs of soldiers in the field and their families back home, the education of evacuated children, and the harvest. Our reserve soldiers, 360,000 of them, were parents, high school principals, and business owners last week. And now they've been thrown into the middle of the desert. When they call home to tell what it's like, we all realize quickly, everything happens so fast. They don't have proper gear or food. They don't have helmets that fit, mounted cameras for evidence collecting, jackets for the cold desert nights. They don't even have proper shoes. We got them equipment, thousands of them, as much as we could find. We team up with ministries from across the country and city municipalities. We provide school supplies for kids evacuated from the Lebanon border to Nazareth and those evacuated from the Gaza border to central Israel. We even build a school from scratch together with the city of Ranana near Tel Aviv. As for the agriculture crisis that resulted from thousands of foreign workers fleeing the war, money can only help so much. Manpower is the key. So the Ma'oz team goes down into the field to harvest together with thousands of other Israelis who understand the ramifications of a food shortage. We pick tomatoes near the Gaza border to the sounds of explosions. This is our country. We have nowhere else to go. What we do have is the promise that this is where we are supposed to be and that all Israel shall be saved. You can provide much needed aid to Israelis impacted by the war. Go to IsraelNeedsMe.com and make a generous donation today. Hamas, what does this word mean? Do we see the word Hamas in the Bible? Right now, Shani will teach you in your Hebrew word of the day, the word Hamas. Shalom from Jerusalem. My name is Shani Ferguson and your Hebrew word of the day is Hamas. Did you know that the word Hamas is in the Bible? More on that in a minute. Now, you've probably only ever heard the word Hamas when referring to the organization that took control over Gaza by force in the 2007 Battle of Gaza after Palestinians elected a president from Fatah to rule over them. That, by the way, had nothing to do with Israel. Since the military coup, Hamas has been so confident in their popularity in Gaza that they haven't held elections since. The name Hamas in Arabic is an acronym that stands for the Islamic Resistance Movement. But it's also a play on words in Arabic because the word itself means bravery, zeal, and strength. The Bible, on the other hand, doesn't share that same positive vibe with the word Hamas. In the Hebrew Bible, the word Hamas means to take something from its owner without permission, to oppress, destroy, rob, pillage, and commit libel, injustice, and violence. Genesis 6.11 describes the days of Noah. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of Hamas. 2 Samuel 22, 47 through 49 says, The Lord lives, praise be to my rock, exalted be my God, the rock my savior. He is the God who avenges me, who puts the nations under me, who sets me free from my enemies. You exalted me above my foes. From a Hamas man, you rescued me. Ezekiel 45, 9 says, Give up your Hamas and oppression and do what is just and right. If these descriptions sound similar to what you hear is being done by the organization claiming the name Hamas today, don't be surprised. The Bible is a fascinatingly prophetic book and Hamas is just living up to its name. God's word is a light to our path and it is important that we realize that when trying to understand 
the perilous world around us. But with his wisdom, we are able to recognize what is happening in front of our eyes. Until next time, I'm Shani Ferguson. Shalom from Jerusalem. Shalom. Welcome to Ma'oz Israel. We begin our series, Israel at War. On today's program, we will discuss the realities of the barbaric Hamas invasion and attack on Israel and the events surrounding October 7, 2023. Right now, we are still at war with Hamas, and Israel has stated officially we will not stop fighting until Hamas is eliminated and all the hostages are released. The day after Sukkot is a holiday called Simchat Torah. In Hebrew, it is the joy of the Torah. So a celebration of the joy of the Word of God given to the people of Israel, a day of joy. And on October 7th, it was a special day for Israelis as it also landed on Shabbat. And it was on this day that Hamas chose to attack, unleashing a demonic rage of hate upon Israel's chosen people in the land of promise. The Hamas barbaric invasion showed the true nature of this Palestinian terroristic society and culture that has been developing for the past several decades in Gaza and in other areas as well. Hamas is designated as a terrorist organization by the United States, European Union, and many other countries. It controls the Gaza Strip by brutal force. This organization's charter calls for the destruction of Israel, making any form of peaceful negotiations impossible, especially after they've proven by their actions that they truly believe in their charter to eliminate Israel. It is important to understand that they are very boldly and continually declaring that they will keep doing the same things over and over again. This is why we're at war and this is why we must put an end to Hamas and all terrorist groups like them in Gaza. And we must stop these hate-filled barbarians from killing our families in Israel. Hamas has been declaring for years that their goal was the destruction of Israel and the Jewish people worldwide. But their goal, however, is not to just stop with Israel and the Jews. They want to kill anyone who is not like them, everyone who is not under their Islamic control. So what we always knew in Israel is now being revealed on a large scale. The atrocities they committed are so horrific and such inhumane levels. I'm at a loss of words to describe in full what really took place. But I want to attempt to take you through the events that occurred On October 7, 2023, at least 3,000 Hamas militants carried out coordinated attacks in several locations across Israel. Hamas actually filmed with body cams and other devices their actions that day. And along with the video footage from CCTV cameras and people recording with their cell phones, we have no doubt as to what happened. These attacks were not only aimed at military targets, but also civilian areas as well. Hamas did not just kill Israeli Jews that day. There were dozens of foreign workers killed, as well as non-Jewish residents of the area, such as Bedouins and Muslim Arabs, who were seen and heard on video footage to be saying, in Arabic, I'm an Arab, I'm a Muslim, don't shoot, to which Hamas murderers replied, it doesn't matter, you're here and you're with them. And then the man in the video is shot at a point-blank range. Hamas pillaged, raped, plundered, murdered, and burned to the ground, in some cases, entire towns in southern Israel by land and by air. The Hamas attack on October 7th per capita is the deadliest terror attack in the world in modern history. Considering the size of Israel, it's as if 50,000 Americans had died on September 11, 2001. The October 7th attack was the deadliest terror attack since Israel's modern existence in 1948. And it is 30 times larger than the second most deadly attack in Israel, which occurred in 1978. The scale and number of the death toll is unprecedented in Israeli history. Thousands of Hamas murderers insanely went through Israel, shooting, stabbing, choking, beheading, burning people alive, and even more. And all these acts are being documented by millions of data points of evidence. We're talking about countless forensic samples now photographed, filmed, and cataloged. So many people are saying around the world that what happened is exaggerated or not real. But I can assure you there are thousands and thousands of witnesses in Israel to what took place. There is no deep fake here. 
This actually took place, and in fact, I myself, I'm an eyewitness to these events. During the first months of the war, I was volunteering to help the Israeli army. Our ministry, Ma'oz Israel, has helped thousands of soldiers with all kinds of supplies, including food and water, shoes, coats, and much more. One army base close to the Gaza border was in need of some special media equipment. I went personally to this army base as I have been going to other bases to give what we could to help them. And one of the head commanders wanted to show me what they needed the equipment for. He brought me to a large tent in a field where I saw dozens and dozens of large bags and in them contain human remains from various Israeli towns. So can you imagine? I was in shock. I did not know that I was going to see this. And the commander said to me, I wanted you to see what we're using this media equipment for. We're documenting the remains of those slaughtered, burned, and destroyed on October 7th. So I can testify that what occurred is worse than you can imagine. And unfortunately, many of us in Israel have witnessed things that no human should ever see. So how did it start? On October 7th, Hamas militants carried out coordinated attacks in several locations across Israel. They breached the security barrier between Gaza and Israel in more than 30 points. Along the different barriers, they used bulldozers, coordinated explosions, and they even flew manned and unmanned aerial vehicles such as weaponized drones, paragliders that were armed with machine guns, bombs, and other deadly weapons used to target innocent people in Israel. But first, they destroyed the surveillance cameras and the sensors, allowing them to create confusion, which delayed Israel's response for hours. And it allowed Hamas to fully breach the barriers and to flood into Israel by the thousands. It is clear this attack was planned for many years, and Israeli intelligence agencies believe the attack was planned and coordinated with the help of other countries and terrorist groups. Okay, now let's talk about the rocket fire that occurred. During this time, there were rockets raining down on us in numbers we've never seen launching from Gaza. Millions of Israelis woke up on October 7 to the sound of air raid sirens as thousands of rockets rained down on the cities all over Israel. And while Israel's Iron Dome anti-missile system intercepted many of the rockets that were fired from Hamas militants, they were unable to catch them all. And many hit and killed Israelis in their homes, destroying cars and buildings and setting entire neighborhoods on fire. The rockets hit an Israeli hospital in Ashkelon as just one example of hundreds of areas being affected. And as the missile attacks continued, schools and kindergartens were hit. And due to the enormous number of missiles, we saw the evacuation of hundreds of thousands of Israelis to more safe areas. And under this barrage of rocket fire, thousands of Hamas gunmen stormed into southern Israel from Gaza and gangs of Hamas terrorists suddenly flooded Israeli communities, destroying the peaceful Shabbat and the rest of the families that day. Hamas was killing and kidnapping horrified Israelis. There were foreigners of all kinds fleeing to any place they could find to escape. And in many cases, for hours and hours until Israeli soldiers rescued them. Hundreds of traumatized survivors eventually came out of their hiding to find the bodies of their families and loved ones scattered across their houses, yards, gardens, fields, and all over the roads. Now, I want to walk you through the major terror attacks which took place that day on October 7th, and we begin with Reim. Let's start with a mass killing at the Supernova Music Festival, also known as just Nova. Thousands of people at the music festival were among the first targets of Hamas Palestinian gunmen who descended upon the event near Kibbutz Ra'im in the desert by air on paragliders and by road, all while under the cover of massive rocket fire. This was the largest number of people killed of all the massacres that were targeting Israelis. 364 mostly young people were killed at the event. More than 40 were taken hostage, including many young girls who were raped and brutalized. 
Dozens more sustained serious injuries. Armed Hamas terrorists dressed in military uniforms surrounded the festival and started firing on individuals attempting to escape. People fled to nearby locations such as bomb shelters, bushes, and fields, and many were killed while hiding. Those who were trying to escape by car were ambushed while Hamas began to fire inside their vehicles. The militants executed wounded individuals at point-blank range as they laid on the ground. I want you to know my personal story from October 7th and how I found out about what was happening. My family and I were celebrating Sukkot with our congregation in northern Israel camping together, and I came home with some of my kids the night before. On October 6th, I came back home, and on October 7th, in the morning hours, we were awakened by constant sirens and rocket explosions, and this continued frequently throughout the day and for several days afterwards. It was worse for other cities than ours. And that same morning, while we were safe in our safe area during the rocket attacks, I received a phone call from a dear friend, Alan, who's also a member of our team. He said, I think they might have killed my brother. I asked Alan, who killed your brother? I knew of the missile attacks that were happening because this had happened every, every few months or so. But I had no idea of the other attacks in southern Israel. So Alan said, my brother Victor was at a music festival in the south, and he heard rocket and gunshots, and he fled in his car and drove away. And then he called me and said he had turned into a nearby kibbutz, and he saw people being shot to his left and to his right. People were dying all around him. Then Alan said that his brother Victor's phone went dead suddenly. And he said, Kobe, please pray for Victor. Please pray. So I began to contact other people. We began to pray together. And I believe the Lord answered our prayers. As Victor saw horrors happening all around him, I believe Victor is a miracle. And he was delivered and saved. As Hamas was ambushing people who were trying to escape, Victor says that all of a sudden it was his turn to drive past where all the shooting was happening. But for some reason, the shooting stopped for a few seconds. He says he doesn't know Really what happened if they stopped to reload or their guns may be jammed. But whatever happened, Victor and his friends with him escaped. Then he came to a fork in the road. To the left was Kfar Aza and to the right was Kibbutz Saad. Victor turned right and was safe in a bunker until IDF soldiers came and rescued him later that day and told him he could leave. But suddenly many of those who were fleeing turned left. They went into Kfar Aza and were slaughtered, as this was one of the worst areas hit by the terror attacks. So this brings us to the next area that was attacked, and that's the beautiful kibbutz of Kfa Aza, which was nearly completely devastated. An Israeli farming community of 750 people, just a short distance from the Gaza Strip, it was among the communities hit hardest by the Hamas assault on southern Israel. At least 100 people murdered, missing, or abducted. This quiet little village was turned into a killing field as terrorists went from house to house, slaughtering its residents at the very start of the surprise attack. One Kfa Aza attack survivor, Avidor Schwartzman, said he hid with his wife and one-year-old daughter in the safe room of their house for more than 20 hours before being rescued by Israeli soldiers. And when he emerged, he said the scene was like pure hell. The 38-year-old said there were bodies everywhere, dead bodies everywhere. We saw our little piece of paradise, our little piece of heaven was totally burned, burnt, and with blood and bodies everywhere. The next town in the path of the Hamas rampage of October 7th is Beri. Beri is an agricultural kibbutz close to Gaza, which once hosted Gazan farm workers. It was also one of the first towns hit by Hamas at the very start of the attacks. Video footage shows Hamas gunmen violently abusing Beri residents. In another video, the same residents are then seen later lying dead further up the road. The CCTV footage also shows gunmen shooting in the occupants of a car as it tried to drive through a security gate at the kibbutz. Israeli paramedic Hani Atias was one of the first responders who went into Beri in the aftermath of the raid. He said he saw the bodies of scores of men and women and children gunned down or blown up 
by Hamas militants. He said nothing could prepare me for what happened there. This is a clinic in Berry where on October 7th, those who are part of the emergency civilian team that go out and defend in case of um, infiltration from terrorists, some of them were wounded and they came here and so there was a nurse and a doctor who came here to take care of them. It was a huge battle that took place, as you can see, and it's, it's like a place frozen in time. And it memorialized where the nurse was killed. The doctor tried to come out and rescue another nurse who did survive. This is Amit. She didn't have to come here on October 7th, but she saw it as her duty. You can hear the explosions in the background. That's the war taking place in Gaza, where our IDF soldiers are literally uprooting tunnels, miles, hundreds of miles of tunnels. And the only way to get to them is to completely demolish whole neighborhoods. But that was by design, by Hamas's design. There was about 40 terrorists in this house and 15 hostages. And there was a lot of back and forth in hostage negotiations. In the end, a tank fired and they still don't know, they're still investigating whether the hostages were killed by our forces or by the terrorists. But the 40 terrorists were also killed when the house was taken down. On October 7th, there was a lot of chaos and people didn't know where to go. They were used to going to bomb shelters when, when rockets were flying, they weren't used to hundreds of terrorists. And so these people that are pictured here ran into this house for safety and then they were taken hostage by the terrorists. There was hundreds of them running through the streets in this small kibbutz, which was Pretty much a, a Garden of Eden, a paradise in the middle of the desert. The next town we go to is Neil Oz, where over 100 people were murdered, considered missing and abducted. On October 7th, just under 400 people lived on the small kibbutz and only a mile from the border. At least 25 people were murdered and over 80 are classified as missing, many of them abducted to the Gaza Strip. And finally, we come to Shtelot, which is the largest Israeli town overlooking the Gaza Strip. Hamas gunmen sprayed cars with bullets, leaving people dead in their vehicles, and others were scattered along the road. 
Video footage shows multiple bodies and vehicles riddled with bullets in the southern Israeli town where groups of Hamas gunmen were still fighting Israeli troops 12 hours even after the attack was launched. Shlomi from Shterot said, I went out and I saw loads of bodies of terrorists, civilians, cars shot up, a sea of bodies inside Shterot along the road and other places. There were loads of bodies. Other video footage showed Hamas gunmen in a white pickup truck cruising throughout the town where they also seized a police station and gunned down elderly residents waiting at a bus stop. Now, these are some of the main attacks of October 7th, and there are other villages and other areas attacked as well, with hundreds butchered, kidnapped, and severely wounded Israelis. As we find ourselves in Israel facing some of the biggest challenges since the modern founding of Israel, and certainly the most difficult time I've faced in Israel in my lifetime, we still are encouraged by the massive outpouring of love and support by Christians worldwide. But there's still also a huge number of haters out there. And unfortunately, many of them are also so-called Christians. Many of them misguided and uninformed or unaware of God's plan and his heart for Israel. And they're unaware that the church is called to bless and comfort and help Israel in their time of distress. Many choose to turn a blind eye on Israel in their time of difficulty, or many join in with the adversaries as they condemn and undermine Israel. But if you are watching now, I believe the Lord is speaking to you that now is the time to stand for God's chosen people, Israel. And Israel isn't chosen because they're better than you or more loved by God than other people. No, Israel is chosen because they're important to God and they're just important for his plan for the world. And so right now, you have an opportunity to reach Israelis in practical ways to show them the love of Yeshua. I encourage you to give to Ma'oz Israel and empower our efforts to make Israel strong during this time. You can say with your actions, and with your words, I stand with Israel because Israel needs you. For Ma'oz Israel, I'm Kobe Ferguson. Shalom, shalom. Join us for the latest news updates, teachings, podcasts, music, and more straight from the land of Israel to you. 